Welcome to day four of Biodiversity Without Boundaries. It's great to be here in Alabama with Jim Godwin, who's the zoologist, master of all things <laughs> for the Alabama Natural Heritage Program, which is part of the Museum of Natural History at Auburn University. And we've had, we had a great day in the field yesterday. Tell me, well, yeah. first tell me a little well, bit about what well, you do. First, I'm glad, I'm glad you made it down. Absolutely. And so that we can show you some incredible well, things we have in Alabama. Alabama kind of gets overlooked, and we have, we're a biodiversity, very rich state. So, yeah, some of the things we did yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so, yeah, we, okay, well, so we had to cram in a lot into a kind of a limited geographical area, so we did our best. Yeah. And when we, we chose uh, Conecuh National Forest, which is in the extreme southern part of the state, because we figured this would, if we're going to do a field trip, this gives us a lot of variety, and kind of scratches the surface of what we have here in the state. And so, so we first went out to visit the site where we we're reintroducing Easter indigo snakes. And we spent cool some projects. time there and walked around and talked about it. Unfortunately, we didn't see any snakes because, you know, uh, it's, it was just not good timing for the snakes. But you know, yeah. we did that. Uh, we spent some time at Salt Pond, which is uh, it's not salty. Not salty. Yeah, it, I did. Someone knows the derivation of the name. Uh, anyway, yeah. So we spent some time there talking about you know this this really, really uh, critically important isolated ephemeral pond to uh, the continuance to the survival of uh, things like the gopher frog. You know, and, uh, the gopher frog is really interesting because the gopher tortoise. And it depends on the tortoise to some extent. You know, of course, they have a similar name, but it's one of those really great stories of how this is all intertwined. Um, and also, I wanted to go back to you talking about the indigo snakes. Right? One of the sort of funny things about doing this work with the Nature Store programs is we're going out to try and see and experience the work that you do. And the work that you do is often with imperiled species, which means there's not necessarily that many of them. So when we're trying to find plants, like Venus flytraps or something like that, we can find them usually. But with the snakes and the frogs and the tortoises, it's a whole different story. It is. Yes. But we did see tortoises today. We saw tortoises. We saw tortoises underground using a borrow camera, which is a visual tool to see what's in a tortoise burrow. And yes, we saw gopher tortoises. Potentially, we could have seen a gopher frog. We could have seen an eastern diamondback snake, diamondback rattlesnake, excuse me. Uh, you know, there's a variety of animals that utilize the tortoise burrows. Right. And then you uh, arranged a special tree for us in the afternoon. Okay, didn't yes. You? Yeah. So, so Alabama is very rich with freshwater turtles, and that's actually kind of my passion for freshwater turtles. Uh, my memories, some of the first memories I have as a child are having turtles. It just kind of came back, you know, to me in this position. And so, uh, for example, being, you know, our positions are self-funded, so we have to seek out our grants. And in doing so, I look for things that I want to do. And, you know, and so when we're writing grants to the Department of Conservation or some agency like that, and they're, they need to, they need fresh information, fresh data on you know particular turtle species. Then yeah, I will. I'll try to focus my grant on that. And so, one of the animals I've worked with over the years has been the alligator snapping turtle. And it's an animal that uh, few people, unless you you have to go out and look for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, so to do that, we have to set nets, we have to set traps, made them fish. We have to know where to go. And uh, you know, but the thing is. Seeing one of these turtles in the wild is, is a very special experience. And, you know, so, yeah, I made the effort yesterday because I wanted to try to provide that. Yeah. And you know, we were lucky that we did catch one, about a 25-pound female turtle. Uh, it was an impressive beast, and, but this yeah. big. And you said they get to be... Well, the females can be, reach a maximum size of about 65 pounds. Hard to imagine, yes. given that what we saw was 20 pound, 25 pounds and was you know, easily this big. And then the males can exceed 100 pounds. That's incredible. 
<laughs> and you've been bitten by one. I've been bitten by one. Yeah, a small one. Thankfully, small one. Yeah, I have all my fingers. <laughs> so, Jim, is there anything you want to, other than you know what you said at the beginning, which I think is really, really important, which is that Alabama is a little bit overlooked, but is one of the most biodiverse states in the country and has amazing concentrations of really cool things. Yeah. Is there anything else about Alabama or about your program that you want to share with the rest of the network? I would say partnerships because we, yeah, with the Natural Heritage Program, if we're going to conserve, preserve, restore the plants, the animals, the natural communities, it involves many other people. You know, we're just collecting the data. And so uh, what's critical to our work at Connecticut National Forest is that we are partnering and collaborating with the U.S. Fish and I mean, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And this also extends to other work that I'm doing with some of my other projects. Mm -hmm. That's great. And partnerships, of course, is a huge part of what the Observe the Whole Network is all about. So thank you for that. Thank you for the great treat yesterday. And uh, up next is going to be Network Highlights, followed by the Awards Luncheon. Uh, enjoy the final day of Biodiversity Without Boundaries in 2021. Thanks. Greetings to you all in the network. My name is Joe Rocchio, and I am the program manager for the Washington Natural Heritage Program. And I'm speaking to you today from the shores of Puget Sound at the Witter Bay Natural Resources Conservation Area. And uh, we've had an eventful year despite all the challenges we've all been faced with. Uh, we continue to develop CCVIs for our rare plants. Uh, we've been conducting EIAs or ecological integrity assessments across the Washington State Park System. We've also been continuing our research at looking at how adjacent land use affects uh, the ecological integrity of Puget Lowland Bogs. And we've also recently received funding to look at uh, using EIA as well as existing element occurrence data to attempt to identify additional areas of high biodiversity value, such as Witter Bay. Um, and we're gonna identify conservation and restoration priorities with that project. And then we've um, recently just published our research that we've been conducting at Crowberry Bog in the journal Ecohydrology. Crowberry Bog is significant in that it is the um, newest natural area preserve in the state of Washington, and also the only known raised bog to occur in the lower 48 of the United States, Western United States. Uh, so we hope you are all well, and we look forward to bumping into you again at a future BWB. And if you find yourself in Washington State anytime soon, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. We'd be happy to point you in the direction uh, of places where you can enjoy Washington's natural heritage. So we wish you all the best. Greetings from Vermont. I'm Everett Marshall with the Vermont Natural Heritage Inventory, and I'd like to share a few program highlights. Last year, we participated in the introduction of the federally endangered Jessup's milk vetch along the Connecticut River, and will continue work with an Endangered Species Recovery Challenge grant. We also began implementation of a three-year EPA wetlands development grant to document rare plants in natural communities. Illustrated here by Colchester Bog, a shrub dominated peatland with scattered pitch pine. We also conducted bee sampling in the Lake Champlain Basin as part of a Northeast regional project, project to study the response of pollinators to habitat practices. And finally, Vermont recently updated links between our state's natural community classification and the national vegetation classification. On two days in summer 2020, staff from the Indiana Natural Heritage Data Center conducted field surveys at Winnemac Fish and Wildlife Area in northwestern Indiana. Prior to these surveys, little was known about natural areas at the property. The surveys resulted in the discovery of the globally imperiled inland coastal plain marsh plant community. This natural community requires occasional inundation to reduce competition from aggressively growing native plant species. Plants that are more common along the Atlantic Ocean and Gulf of Mexico, referred to as coastal plain disjuncts, are regularly found inland in this community. 18 plant species of conservation concern were discovered during the surveys. Of these, 11 had never before been documented as occurring in Pulaski County. 
Hypericum adpressum, shown on the left, is a globally vulnerable St. John's wort that is a species of conservation concern throughout its entire range. Coleotenia longifolia subspecies longifolia, shown on the right, is a coastal plain disjunct that was considered extirpated from Indiana prior to our surveys. The nearest known extant population of this grass is about 100 miles away in Allegan County, Michigan. Discovering this natural area was a highlight for our program in 2020. Twenty was a big year for North Carolina's Natural Heritage Program. We completed a range-wide status survey of Venus flytrap in which we visited public and privately owned populations across the coastal plain of North Carolina and South Carolina. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will use this information as they determine whether to list the Venus flytrap as an endangered species. Our staff also discovered a new population of a G1S1 plant. Roses Hartley. This species was formerly known from only one location. This new population helped convince the North Carolina Land and Water Fund to allocate funding to acquire this land for conservation. And finally, our botanist, Wes Knapp, worked with NatureServes and Francis and a team of botanists from across the United States to determine how many plant species have gone extinct in the United States and Canada since European settlement. The results of this study help underscore the vital importance of our work for biodiversity conservation. We have all had that moment growing up where we have uh, watched fireflies with our family and there's just something magical about that experience. We actually likely have several dozen species of fireflies and it is because of our efforts of our citizen scientists that we actually have confirmed two populations so far of synchronous fireflies on public lands in West Virginia. So you can do this on your computer or your cell phone. We do have an app you can download, the Survey123 app, which will allow you to identify and give us your location of fireflies that you have been seeing. And so that way we can gather data and information from you as well. By documenting fireflies in the state, we can try to correlate reasons for their decline and also determine best management practices to allow fireflies to exist in our environment. Welcome to the 2021 Biodiversity Without Boundaries Awards Lunch. Today, we take time to honor those who have gone above and beyond in support of biodiversity and conservation science. Today, we are handing out four awards. First, we will recognize the contributions of our network partners and present three NatureServe Network Awards, one each in collaboration, innovation, and leadership. These awards are an opportunity to celebrate the network's commitment to science-based conservation. After the Network Awards, we will present the first ever Robert E. Jenkins Lifetime Achievement Award. Bob was the architect of the NatureServe Network and one of the most effective conservation champions ever. He passed away last year on December 3rd, and we honor Bob's extraordinary conservation legacy with this award. In addition, NatureServe has established the Robert E. Jenkins Legacy Fund to ensure that his vital work is continued. Congratulations to all of the recipients and thank you for all that you do for biodiversity. Hello, I'm Nicole Furlat, the manager of Habitat and Endangered Species for the province of Manitoba. I'm in my ninth year as the Canadian representative on the NatureServe Board of Directors, where I am currently the vice chairperson. I am super happy to be with you today to present the NatureServe Network Award for Collaboration to the Ecosystem-Based Automated Range Maps Initiative, or EBAR. To NatureServe Canada, represented by Patrick Henry, the British Columbia Conservation Data Centre, represented by Damien Jolie and Jacqueline Clare, 
and to the Northwest Territories Conservation Data Center represented by Susan Carrier. But before we hear from this worthy group, let me tell you a little bit about this initiative and about the excellent collaboration that made it possible. NatureServe Canada's ecosystem-based range maps or EBAR initiative is developing publicly accessible range maps for priority species. The objectives of the project are to develop national range maps that incorporate the best available species occurrence information, can be reviewed and refined by species experts in an ongoing and efficient manner, provide access to reference information of the underlying occurrence data, are publicly available at no charge, and are provided in an electronic format that permits efficient customization and integration by biodiversity experts, organizations, and decision makers. The project was discussed by NutriSurf Canada as early as 2017 and first funded and implemented in August of 2019. The concept of eBAR was inspired by projects and presentations from a few NatureServe network member programs, including Oregon, British Columbia, Northwest Territories, and Wyoming. eBAR maps combine biodiversity data with expert knowledge to populate ecoshapes, which are ecoregions, ecodistricts, or similar ecological land classifications with species presence information. Each ecoshape is associated with a set of references for species information providing transparency regarding the underlying data. Let me wow you with some key statistics. 4.8 million occurrence records were mined from 163 data sources. 1,254 auto-generated eBAR maps resulted. Over 100 experts have reviewed the auto-generated ranges. 239 maps passed expert review and are now available to the public. The eBAR program is entering phase two and now going to focus on eBAR ranges of priority species at risk that have been listed under federal and national species at risk programs, including the Species at Risk Act and the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada or COSIWIC. NatureServe Canada eBAR maps will support priority programs such as environmental impact assessments, status assessments by COSIWIC, Species at Risk Act recovery action plans, the identification of key biodiversity areas, and provincial and territorial species at risk programs and legislation. There is no doubt that this is a great tool. The NatureSurf Canada eBAR team, composed of NatureSurf Canada, BC, and NWT, kicked off and have implemented the project in coordinated and collaborative approach. The NatureSurf network provided in-kind input crucial to the success of the project. This eBAR concept is the result of input from existing projects from the NatureSurf network programs. Network programs from Canada and the US provided their data at no cost to the eBAR project. The eBAR online ex expert review tool provided uh, borrowed code from the NatureServe Mobi online review tool. Member programs, partner organizations, and over 100 species experts have contributed hundreds of hours to expert review of the auto generated eBAR ranges, making this a truly collaborative network project proving once again that we are stronger together and that there is power in the network. It is my sincere pleasure to present the NatureServe Network Award for collaboration to NatureServe Canada, the British Columbia Conservation Data Center, and the Northwest Territories Conservation Data Center for their outstanding efforts in supporting and implementing the ecosystem-based automated range maps initiatives. It's hard to clap visually, but yay. Thank you very much, Nicole, for that, uh, those nice words. And thank you uh, to NatureServe members, personnel, board of directors, and all who were part of the award selection committee. Uh, NatureServe Canada greatly appreciates this recognition of the eBAR project. Uh, as the saying goes, it takes a network to raise an eBAR project or a village or something like that. I'd like to confirm that this collaboration award is well suited to this project. 
the Eagle Bar concept, as Nicole said, is the result of input from a broad number of organizations across the nature network. And uh, Nicole listed a few, including Oregon, Wyoming, British Columbia, and Northwest Territories. In-kind resources from the project have come from organizations and individuals from across Canada and the USA. I'd like to thank NatureServe and all NatureServe network members and the conservation data centers in Canada who contributed their data and hundreds of hours of staff time to fulfill data requests and provide expert review of EBAR ranges. In-kind resources are critical to a multi-organization collaborative project like EBAR. Cash funding also ranks very highly on the list of critical resources. I'd like to thank Environment and Climate Change Canada for their funding that enabled the full-scale rollout of the EBAR project and for their ongoing financial support and interest in EBAR work today. I'd also like to thank and recognize World Bank of Canada's Nature Tech Fund and Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada's generous support of EBAR work, specifically directed to inform key biodiversity areas of Canada analyses. Thank you to all. I encourage you to learn more about eBuyer by exploring our project page on NatureServe Canada's website at www.natureserve.ca, where you can access project information and links to our published eBuyer ranges and our Esri eBuyer online app. Speaking of explore, uh, we continue to work with NatureServe to make eBuyer ranges available via hyperlinks published in the distribution section of Species Element of Records in Explorer and soon via the Hexagon Framework in Explorer Pro. To wrap up, I'd like to confirm NatureServe Canada's keen interest to help support adoption of eBar range mapping by NatureServe and NatureServe network member programs. Project documentation is available on our website, development code is available on GitHub, and eBar team members are standing by for your questions. We're currently holding meetings with NatureServe personnel in order to scope options for moving forward with a network eBar project for North American ranges of priority species. The next phase of this collaborative project. Very exciting. We hope to hear from you and thank you again for the recognition of the eBar project. Hi, I'm Damien Jolly from the British Columbia Data or manager of the British Columbia Conservation Data Center. Uh, because of COVID and some happenstance, the award ended up with me and so it's my great honor and privilege to accept this award on behalf of the BC Conservation Center, but Jack and Claire did all the work. So I really want to pass it over to you, Jack. Thanks, Damien. And thank you to NatureServe for recognizing the eBar team with this award. Um, I'd first like to thank Eric LaFroth, who initiated the range mapping project in BC and championed the project at a national scale prior to his retirement. I'd also like to thank Damien and the rest of my colleagues at the BC CDC for their support. Most importantly, big thanks to the rest of the eBar team, Patrick, Amy, Suzanne, Christine, Randall, Samantha, and Rob for all their work. It has been a real pleasure working with you all. Lastly, thank you to the data submitters and the expert reviewers for all your time and effort in making eBar a truly collaborative project. I'm Suzanne Carrière and I work in the Northwest Territories. I'm right here in Yo and I've, I would like um, everybody to remember when we see range maps, uh, that they are based on field work. Um, the eBAR program used uh, data from museums, used data from recent field work. The data from museums also comes from field work that can be 200 to 100 years old or, or even more recent. Uh, this week, um, we were reminded how field work is difficult and can be dangerous. Every single data point on those range maps, uh, people went out to collect that data, sometimes at their personal uh, risk. And the price to pay is not just in terms of money, and time, but also your own personal safety. So I would like to thank everybody that goes out there to collect information and to share that information. Every single data point is, at a, is collected at a huge cost and with passion and with 
dedication over a hundred years. So it's a um, tribute to all that field work to use it in a database, to verify it, to recognize the names of each record, who collected it, who ID'd it, using a lot of effort, taxonomists, and um, data GIS technicians, and those also who did all those echo shapes. Millions of dollars were spent in Canada and the US and Mexico to draw the new lines for each echo shapes in many years to record the ecology of North America and Mexico. I think it behooves to us to actually use that data, all of it. So that's what eBar is about, is putting all that information together in a usable way and to make sure that every single piece of information is referenced, usable, and can be improved over the years. Um, so this week, especially, it is um, important to acknowledge uh, all those people that do field work, colleagues of mine, and also other people that help biologists and ecologists do field work. And so I did receive the, it's right here. It made it all the way to your knife. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all of you. And uh, uh, really thank you for being here to accept the award and for your great words and your great work. And so once again, if everyone would join me in a loud round of virtual clapping, for uh, for these folks for their award and uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, those of you on the East Coast. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast. My name is Dr. Healy Hamilton, and I'm Chief Scientist at NatureServe. And it is my profound honor to have this opportunity to recognize two members of our network for their extraordinary and continuing contributions as innovators. To innovate means to make changes in something that is established, especially by introducing new methods or ideas. And it's really worth considering just how powerful the concept of innovation is when applied in the context of a network. The effects of innovation are experienced more broadly and they have greater impact when there's an interconnected group of colleagues ready to benefit from that innovation in pursuit of a shared mission as we share here in the NatureServe network. And because of the dedication and ingenuity of the recipients of the Network Innovation Award, that is exactly what has happened here. We have created workflows that leverage decades of biodiversity observation data into modern analytical methods. And those workflows are accessible to any heritage program. We've created new foundational data sets for imperiled species that are essential to conservation decisions maintaining the reputation of the NatureServe network as the resource for information on species at risk. And we've created not just a series of static new products, but rather a process for continuously and dynamically producing the best available information on imperiled species distributions. So really due to the innovative efforts of these two individuals, we are a more relevant modern an essential network of vital data for preventing species extinctions. So I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to publicly acknowledge Dr. Tim Howard, Chief Scientist of the New York Natural Heritage Program, and Christopher Tracy, Conservation Planning Man Manager of the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program for their past and continuing contributions to the Map of Biodiversity Importance Project and the Network Species Habitat Modeling Initiative. I cannot overstate how transformational the MOBI project and the modeling initiative has been for NatureServe and for our network. We are work working together more closely, 
producing products that are more relevant and advancing methods as a network at a pace and scale we have not previously achieved. Tim and Chris stand out as innovators, as leaders, as two scientists absolutely committed to the value of this network, to their role in uplifting it, in modernizing it, and to using innovation to increase the impact of our critical mission. So again, I am thrilled to acknowledge Tim and Chris as the incredibly deserving recipients of this year's Network Innovation Award. Tim or Chris, do you have any words you'd like to share? Thank you, Haley, and thank you to the NatureServe Network. I'm truly honored to receive this award, especially alongside of Tim. You know, being part of this MOBI project has been one of the highlights of my heritage career so far. You know, and through this work, through the work with, you know, through our collaboration with the MOBI team and our other partners, I've learned so much through this process. I'm just really happy we're able to create such an incredibly useful product that's helping guide our work into the future. I recently came across a photo from a past Biodiversity Without Boundaries conference that was taken six years ago. Healy had organized a group of us to go out after the normal sessions to, to a pub to discuss how to undertake a network model initiative. You know, none of us knew Moby was on the distant horizon. And but seeing this photo is a really great reminder of how far we've come, what we've accomplished so far, and how much work we still need to do. And I really look forward to contributing to that effort. Thanks again. Tim, do you have any words you'd like to share? Sure. Uh, thanks. Chris, and thank you, Healy, um, uh, and thanks, NatureServe, for, for this recognition and for, for everything you've done to help move uh, modeling forward. We re I really, really appreciate it. I'm thrilled and surprised and excited to be, to be a part of this and to be recognized. And I've got my little, my cute little award right here, which I love. So thank you for sending that on, and um, I'm very happy about it. Um, you know, it's really this effort. And, and the whole modeling effort from, from the beginning has been a collaboration of all of us, of all members of the network, and um, so many people across, across, the, you know, across the entire NatureServe network and the heritage, heritage um, programs. And I really re want to recognize that that's, that's what's really driving this forward. It's not just me. It's not just Chris. It's not just the small Moby team. It's, it's contributions from all of us. And and I, you know that's sort of my philosophy is I think we can really do better work when we ha and we can have better products um, if we collaborate together and all work together to make to move these things forward. So with that, I'd like to recognize all of us for doing such a great job on moving this product forward and moving these efforts forward. And um, and um, thank you for for acknowledging um, acknowledging this bigger effort as part of what we're doing. So thank you, Haley. Thank you, NatureServe. And I'm thrilled about this. It's a lot of fun. Well, on behalf of NatureServe and the entire network, thank you so much, Tim and Chris, for just your, your constant dedication and leadership. Together, we truly are lifting up the network to raise the capacity of all programs to the, to the greatest extent possible. And, and that is the, the benefit and the beauty of being part of a network. So thank you for your leadership. And congratulations for being Innovators of the Year. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Bryce Maxwell. I'm the program coordinator at the Montana Natural Heritage Program and one of the uh, U.S. section's representative on uh, NatureServe Board of Directors. I'm Brian Klatt. I'm the uh, director of the Michigan Natural Features Inventory. And like Bryce, I am also one of the uh, section representatives to the NatureServe uh, Board of Directors. And today we want to both heartily congratulate Bob Gottfried, the database lead for the Texas Wildlife Diversity Branch, uh, in receiving uh, NatureServe's Network Award for Leadership. Um, he's a very well-deserved recipient of this award for his numerous contributions in leading the network. Many of you probably know that Bob long served as the chair of the U.S. Section Council but you might have forgotten how far back that role went. He started in 2012 and served in that role all the way through the beginning of 2021. Bob did a fantastic job as the chair. He ably steered section council calls to address topics that needed to be brought forward. He called out individual program leads to get them engaged. And when necessary, he called out NatureServe to address important issues. 
Bob acted with a deep knowledge of the network and the recognition of the unique situation of individual programs. Two things that I want to highlight in particular about Bob are that we could always count on him to uh, use common sense to propose common sense solutions that involved improved communications in the network, whether that's between programs or between and in programs or the council and, and nature serve. Uh, and the second is Bob is simply unparalleled in his ability to come up with something witty to say during meeting pauses, sometimes awkward pauses, in order to lighten the mood and move things along or to recruit people to get things done. For example, in recruiting for one task, Bob said something to the effect of, if your idea of fun is sitting down to a rerun of Matlock with a bowl of oatmeal, this could be the right task for you. As another example, I asked Bob about his history with the network in order to prepare for this. And as part of uh, his response, he said, well, you could say that Gary Lester with the Louisiana Natural Heritage Program found me in a smoldering crater where I had crashed to earth when I was sent away by my parents before my home planet of data managia exploded. Gary raised me as his own after I saved him that very day from a rabid marauding armadillo and the rest is history. Bob was indeed hired by Gary Lester as a data manager when he joined the Louisiana program in 1998. He subsequently was a data manager at the Illinois Natural Heritage Program in 2000. And since 2004, he's been the database program lead for the Texas Wildlife Diversity Branch. He also served as the vice chair of the U.S. Section Council in 2011. I'll turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Bryce. Um, I just want to add there, there, you know, Bob's got a list of accomplishments with the network that is really quite extensive. And, you know, one of them I want to mention uh, is his recent uh, efforts with uh, CAFLA, which have been just incredibly uh, successful and have brought uh, new opportunities to the network. And, I, you know, I've been asked to, as uh, you know, to, to go over some of the virtues that Bob has. And I have limited time, so I just made a few notes that I'll read to you now. <laughs> My experience with Bob uh, was primarily on the U.S. Section Council, um, where I served as vice chair for, for years under his chairmanship. Um, and as, as Bryce has already pointed out, Bob brought to that position an incredible thoughtfulness, uh, Knowledge of the uh, knowledge of the network, and always making sure to come up with solutions that that help nature serve and the network. Uh, he's done it with with humility. He's done it with humor, um, and despite the fact that he's been in Texas a long time, it's uh, you know he's he's not. <laughs> and I do love that 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 Superman metaphor. Um, he <laughs> he has kept true to his Midwestern roots of uh, of humility and. Uh, if we can ask Bob to quit looking at his shoes now and uh, say a few words, uh, that would be great. Bob? Thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Brian. I, uh, I really appreciate those words, uh, and I appreciate the humor uh, that you injected into them. I'm not uh, sure that I deserve all of that uh, uh, accolades that you gave me, uh, but I definitely appreciate them. I have Tremendous amount of respect for both of you. Uh, so it means a lot. I also want to thank NatureServe and uh, the Kitimini that chose me to uh, receive this award. Um, we all know that there's a tremendous amount of talent and a tremendous amount of uh, leadership talent within the network uh, throughout all the programs, throughout all the sections uh, in the network. So to be chosen for this, uh, to receive this award, uh, is a true honor, and I, I greatly appreciate it. I want to give a special thank you to all the members of the Section Council over the years. Um, these uh, people have uh, taken on these, these dedicated people have taken on this role uh, and um, added to their duties uh, within their jobs uh, because their uh, dedication to the network is so strong. And um, their hard work over the years have made me look really uh, much better than I actually am. And so uh, to them, I, I want to thank each and every one of you. I've enjoyed working with all of you. Uh, and last but not least, I want to uh, thank Gary Lester, who is the, uh, uh, the Louisiana Natural Heritage Program coordinator uh, that hired me uh, to be a data manager. Uh, straight out of grad school. He was uh, the one who brought me into the network. And if it wasn't for him, uh, who knows what I'd be doing 
uh, I might not have ever made it into the network. And uh, that would have been a real shame because working as part of the network and with all these great people uh, has been uh, a joy and an honor uh, in my professional career. And uh, I'd hate to think that I never got a chance to do it. So thank you all. Congratulations again, Bob. So well-deserved. Absolutely. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Larry Master, who will present the Robert E. Jenkins Lifetime Achievement Award. Most of you already probably know Larry, but for those that don't, Larry is a conservation biologist, a zoologist, and in his retirement, a master conservation photographer. Larry played a leadership role in establishing the Natural Heritage Network and the standards and methods that we all share for data collection and conservation status assessments. After he retired, he continued to be an active board member at NatureServe and a donor. He continues to be one of our best supporters in so many ways. Thank you, Larry. Hi, my name is Larry Master, and I'm very honored today to present the first ever Robert E. Jenkins Lifetime Achievement Award. The architect of the natural nature Search network and one of the most effective champions for the protection of biological diversity, Robert E. Jenkins, passed away on December 3rd, 2020. Today, we honor Bob's extraordinary conservation legacy by establishing a Robert E. Jenkins Lifetime Achievement Award. This award will be given at each Biodiversity Without Boundaries conference to a late career or recently retired individual from NatureServe or a NatureServe network member program that has successfully advanced Bob's vision for protecting biodiversity. There are four main attributes embodied by Bob Jenkins that undoubtedly aided his success. First, as the pioneering scientist who acknowledged the importance of using data to inform evidence-based biodiversity conservation, Bob Jenkins was a visionary. In the midst of the environmental movement of the 1970s, Bob Jenkins uh, joined the Nature Conservancy as their first science director and recognized that there was no formal scientific process to measure the biological value of land before acquiring areas for conservation. Bob knew that in a world of finite resources and increasing human population, there must be a way to prioritize land conservation uh, for a land acquisition for conservation. After only two months on the job, Bob proposed two objectives for land acquisition, to preserve ecological function and to preserve the full array of biological and ecological diversity. Bob went on to advance the fine filter, coarse filter approach to protect the last of the least, that is imperiled species, and the best of the rest, secure species in native ecosystems. Second, Bob Jenkins was innovative. Knowing that we need to be able to measure biodiversity in order to protect it, Bob led a team of scientists to develop a science-based methodology to prioritize conservation actions. This approach required information that mostly did not exist at the time, data that would document the status and precise locations of imperiled species and exemplary ecosystems. What began as a collaborative effort between the Conservancy and South Carolina State Wildlife Agency in 1974 became a state-by-state -state campaign to collect existing information and then inventory the plant and animal species and ecological communities across the state. And the Natural Heritage Network was born. Bob often said that for something to really work, you have to get it almost exactly right. And the best approach to perfection, he espoused, is, the, is incremental successive approximation, the heritage concept in a nutshell. Bob's idea to place heritage programs within state and provincial governments was a stroke of genius. And the resulting conservation work done by, done by, excuse me, done by these government agencies is incalculable. This model has ensured that species and ecological community data is incorporated into the myriad environmental planning venues at federal, state, provincial, and territorial levels. Third, Bob was passionate. Working to identify and conserve biodiversity was his life's calling. He was not one to shrink from a fight of principle, and those who crossed swords with him would not soon forget it. His passion for his work only grew over the years. And 10 years ago at this very conference, Bob somewhat cheerfully noted that after all this time, I still think of you as my people. 
was Bob's hope and dream that the commitment to conserve biodiversity would live forever through the Natural Heritage Network and all who use our data for decision making. Last but certainly not least, Bob Jenkins was inspiring. Onward and upward was Bob's clarion call to those who cared about biodiversity conservation. Those who worked for him were amazed by a leader whose genius could be observed every day in the smallest decisions about methodology and difficult negotiations to instill the use of science within the conservancy and, and the intricate policy decisions to ensure continuity of the programs. His brilliance, his wit, his insights into people and seemingly intractable issues, his command of the language, his persuasiveness were legendary. His door was always open and the whiteboard in his office was an invitation to share ideas. Bob was a great supervisor, mentor and friend but you didn't have to personally know Bob to be inspired by him. Everyone in this network supporting the mission of using the power of data, science, and technology to guide biodiversity conservation is inspired by his day. The legacy of Bob Jenkins continues to live on throughout the Nature Serve Network. To honor Bob, it is my enormous pleasure to introduce the recipient of the first Robert E. Jenkins Lifetime Achievement Award, Rob Solomon. My friend and former colleague Rob was hired by Bob Jenkins in 1986, two years before I transitioned to leading several heritage programs and becoming the Conservancy Chief Zoologist. In those early days of building the network, Rob played a critical role in the design and development of database software that provides the foundation for consistent record keeping across the continent, just as Bob Jenkins envisioned. As a manager of spatial information systems, Rob established NatureServe's first GIS system and help secure donations of software from major tech companies like Oracle, Hewlett Packard, and Esri. From punch cards and dots on maps, the BCD, GIS, Biotics 5, and now data collection apps on phones in every heritage biologist's pocket, Rob played a critical and supporting hand in every innovation during NatureServe's technology evolution. Beyond the tools, Rob cares deeply and passionately about the network and the people that make up the network. In the early years of his career, Rob personally visited dozens of natural heritage programs, often developing, delivering computers with software to house the program's biodiversity databases. In the later part of his career, his 33-year career, Bob was in regular phone contact with every program in the network, making sure their staff had uninterrupted access to the latest biotics software. In closing, I want to acknowledge the significant role that Rob played over his career, ensuring that the legacy of Bob Jenkins will endure long into the future. His contribution to the design and development of the database and mapping systems used across the NatureServe network was instrumental in the conservation of hundreds of thousands of acres. And as a manager, Rob recruited and mentored the current generation of NatureServe's technology team leaders and inspired in them a deep appreciation for the network. So in recognition, of his career advancing Bob's vision, I am delighted to recognize my friend, Rob Solomon, as the recipient of the first Robert E. Jenkins Lifetime Achievement Award. Congratulations, Rob. Thank you, Larry. Those are wonderful words. It's so wonderful to hear a recap of Bob and all he stood for. Um, and I am so glad to be here to receive this award. Um, many of you know that I that once I start talking and get on a roll, I have a tendency to lose track of time. Um, give this man a PowerPoint slide and he's truly dangerous, they say. Uh, however, I'm still feeling the rough edges of some surgery I had last week, so hopefully you won't mind that I'm mostly going to be reading some prepared comments today. First off, I'd like to extend my thanks to all those who through the TNC alumni Facebook page sent me congratulations and kind words about receiving this award. It was uh, deeply touching to hear from those friends and colleagues from my early years at TNC and longer time with NatureServe. I just want them all to know that my lack of a response was not due to a lack of appreciation, but rather to a lack of presence. Facebook presence that is, yes, admittedly odd for someone whose entire career has been deeply immersed in the IT world as mine has been. Um, but for my own set of perverse reasons, I su su stubbornly avoided a presence in the Facebook universe. However, my wife Karen, being a more sensible and less irrational person, 
was able to join the alumni group, allowing me to view the many wonderful comments left there for me. It was especially touching to hear from folks like Dave Wilkove, John Prince, Brad Northrup, Loring, and others who were there when I got to begin this wonderful career, helping to build and support Bob Jenkins' vision, a career that I believe I knew from the start would be the last job I would ever have and home for me. Along with letting you all know how truly and deeply honored I feel to be the first to receive this award, I also want to tell you of the extreme good fortune I now see I had in getting to speak with Bob early before he passed away. Now, periodically over the long years following Bob's unfortunate separation from this amazing enterprise, he would check in with me to get the latest on how things were going at NatureServe and to share his thoughts on what we were doing right and, of course, what we were doing wrong. Vintage Bob. However, my last conversation with him, which came more than a year after I had retired from NatureServe, was quite different and of a much more personal nature. It was a conversation in which I got to learn more about his personal aspirations, his goals, and the experiences early in his career that led him to his vision and its realization in this enterprise we all have become part of. That alone was enough to make the call an unexpected pleasure. What I am now grateful for, though, in hindsight, was the opportunity it gave me for my perch of 33 years into intermittently, intimately watching his network grow to tell Bob just how much he and his vision meant to me and to the vast member, number of incredibly talented and committed individuals at NatureServe and across the network I've had the honor to know and work with. And I have indeed been fortunate in that regard. Getting, getting to visit close to 40 heritage programs and CDCs during my years with this organization, from Maine to Alaska, Pennsylvania to Arizona, Manitoba to Pan Panama. Fortunate to see where many of you worked, how you worked, and to see a fraction of what it was you were working to conserve and protect. Few now still at nature sort of know what a gift it was, what a gift it is to share this type of space and time with you all. Whitney, I know you're on the call and I know you know this is what this is. For it was from those early visits that I was able to witness firsthand and up close the dedication and passion. And that word has been said many times today, passion. The passion imbued in the wonderful folks that comprise this network and gave me the appreciation for the network that would endure through my entire career at NatureServe and for the rest of my life. This I got to tell Bob. During those early on-site visits, we were often invited to stay at the homes of program staff. And during those days, I would be amazed over and over how many of you all seemed to bring work home with you. But what I quickly learned, and this too I reminded Bob, what, was that it wasn't about bringing extra work home. It was about you bringing your passions with you everywhere. One visit that particularly exemplified this best, and I'll always remember, was one I made to the West Virginia Heritage Program with Margaret Orms many, many years ago. Margaret was the Eastern Regional Information Manager at the time. While we were there, we were invited to stay at the home of Brian McDonald, the program coordinator. When we got to his house the first evening, I was astonished to see practically every square foot of space filled with the signs of his many passions. Three partially rebuilt BMWs in the front yard, a kitchen and dining room filled with exquisitely self-crafted cabinetry. But then upstairs, room after room filled with years worth of field collection specimens, rooms whose only furniture was floor and ceiling plant presses, rooms chock a block with trays containing a small, containing small mammal specimens. And then there, there was the room I was to sleep in with wrap around wall to wall stacks of bug box collections and a bed somewhere in the middle. I think it was amazing indeed, but it was also something I would see repeatedly in some form or another during visits to many other programs. This too, I got to recall when speaking with Bob. But beyond all that, I was also able to tell Bob from my perch as the years passed and staff changed at NatureServe and across the network, 
how I saw time and time again a parade of incredibly dedicated and skilled individuals coming to take the place of those there before them, continually replenishing the network and my universe with a new guard of excellence. A new friend here, colleague or mentor, a growing legion of people I came to respect and admire daily. From Dave Melman to Dave Hover, Beth Rogers to Debbie Webb, Tom Smith to Greg Podnosinski, Linda Evers Hart to Shelley Cook, Pat Mel Hopp to DJ Evans, Bruce Palmer to Sabreton, just to name a few. And then there were those like Margaret Arms, Everett Marshall, Lynn Davidson, Megan Rollins, Jimmy Kagan, who were there when I started and whose passion has yet to diminish. Now we all know the basic genius of Bob's vision, a simple and elegant methodology for cataloging biological features then using that information collected by local experts to ensure that conservation decisions, local and global, be based on science rather than conjecture. But I believe there was an even greater to Bob's vision, greater genius to Bob's vision. I believe Bob saw, saw the Aldo Leopold in all of us as he saw it in himself. And he knew that it was that passion in each of us that would always be there to drive the enterprise forward. I got to tell Bob about the dedication and commitment I saw in nearly every Nietzsche Shreve colleague and network member I worked with from my early years to my last days with the enterprise. And how all of us, even those relatively new to this enterprise, those who perhaps had little sense of who Bob was as an individual, carried a deep gratitude to him for what he had given us, a home for our passion. I got to tell him how many lives had been changed by his vision. To have been able to communicate these things to Bob in his last days was for me beyond fortunate, for I sensed that Bob, while always the cynic, took to heart what I was trying to share with him from my vantage point. Bob wrote to me the day after our call with more thoughts on, on our conversation, and we planned to talk again soon. When some 10 days later, I heard that Bob had passed away. Along with the sadness I felt, I, sadness I felt, I also found comfort in knowing that I had been able to remind him of all these things, both on my own behalf and I believe on behalf of all of you. I had been able to share with him the gratitude we all felt for this place created for us from his vision, the place that fed our passions through the work we did daily, be it the surprise discovery of an S1 G1 plan on Monday in a spot explored endless times before, the last dozen records mapped and entered into biotics on Wednesday, completing data, data entry for a productive field season, or the finessing of the new piece of code on Friday that was going to make the, the Manitoba data manager's life just a little bit easier the following week. Just as it was a comfort and honor for me to be able to share this all with Bob, I believe it brought some degree of comfort and contentment to Bob for him to hear this. So again, my deepest thanks for this honor and for being given this award in Bob's name. Nothing could mean more to me. Thank you. Well, this has been an amazing few days. In general, it feels like we're all a little over Zoom and virtual meetings. But I think we really had a great experience here, and I'm so thrilled that so many people from across the network were able to join. You can be sure that even when we go back to in-person meetings, we'll find a way to allow people to be able to participate remotely so we can have all of the great ideas and camaraderie with everyone again. Among the many other people that I need to thank, I want to especially thank Allison Gratz, who is responsible for the lion's share of making this event a success. In person, that would be an applause line. In this case, just drop a note to her in the chat box. Of course, many more people at NatureServe and in the network contributed to making this a success. And I wanna thank all of you as well. In particular, all of the presenters. You were really great. I loved learning about bats and wildlife cameras and KBAs, tips and tricks for working with the media. And of course, all things explorer, habitat modeling, and so many other things. Thank you for all of the great presentations, and more importantly, thank you for all of the work you do every day to conserve biodiversity. Of course, I've mentioned them before, but I want to bring, mention them again and thank our sponsors, 
They helped us keep registration fees low and also allowed us to use Amy Doty and Digitel to make this experience as good as it was. Those sponsors are NatureSurf Canada, the Virginia Natural Heritage Program, ExxonMobil, the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, Virginia's Land Trusts, or VAULT, United Land Trusts, sorry, Capital One, Virginia Native Plant Trust, and the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. Be sure to sign up early to sponsor BWB next year and beat the rush. It was a special treat for me to be in Florida and Alabama during the program this year. In fact, I'm in Alabama right now, where you can probably hear the weather is fairly intense. Stay tuned for updates from these states, as well as from Tennessee, both with the Natural Heritage Program and the Tennessee Valley Authority, Kentucky and West Virginia in the next month or so. I also wanted to mention that we have one sponsor in place for the Van Humboldt tour. Sly Clyde Cidery outside of Norfolk, Virginia is sponsoring the purchase of carbon offsets for the entire journey. So thank you to Sly Clyde. Finally, thank you again for all that you do. You inspire me.